All right, so Psalm for Beginners. Uh, this is uh, lesson number seven. And we're going to take a look at worship psalms uh, this time. A little bit of background from the, you know, from the very beginning of time, God and man have always had a place where they uh, met in order to carry out their relationship. Uh, we read in Genesis, for example, Adam and Eve, it was the natural and informal setting of the garden, which reflected the open and the free relationship that existed between them at that time. After they were expelled because of sin, uh, we see Adam's descendants meeting with God, still meeting with God, but now at the altar of sacrifice. Still meeting with God, but never without a reminder that sin and death separated them. Uh, Moses built the tabernacle, well the people did obviously, but under his direction, in the desert. And the significance of this was that now God was seen as dwelling among the people, uh, but he was now with them, physically, if you wish, with them. The reminder of sin and death was still present. Obviously, they were still offering sacrifice. But through the work of the priests who you know, mediated the sacrifices on behalf of the people, uh, they did not have to search for God because He was always among them. And this was represented by the fact that the tabernacle was among them. And uh, as we know from reading the Old Testament, the uh, people camped around the uh, tabernacle. As the people settled the promised land, a great desire grew among them to build a temple where a permanent meeting place between God and man could be established. We know that David first desired this and was intent on doing it, but God prevented him because of his, he had too much blood on his hands. He was a warrior. He didn't want him to build the temple. Read about that in 1 Chronicles and 22 and other places. We also know that Solomon, David's son, was given the task uh, to build the temple and under his supervision, eventually that permanent temple was built. Now, the temple represented a lot of things to the Jews, for example. It represented the continual presence of God among the people. The other peoples didn't have this, but they had, I mean, they had temples of sorts, but for the Jews, God was always among them uh, because the temple was there. God dwelt there with them. Also, it was an affirmation that they were a chosen people. Why, why were they the chosen people? Well, because God dwelt among them. They were the chosen ones. Uh, in addition to this, the temple was a continual reminder that their sins were being dealt with by God. It's always the idea of the altar is always there. They're always eventually meeting at the altar but at least their sins are being dealt with by God. Also, there was a confirmation that the throne of the king was legitimate and eternal. David had made Jerusalem not only the place where the king lived, where he dwelt, but also where the temple would be, thus creating a dual significance in the minds of the people concerning the city. The temple validated the throne. The throne of the king was in Jerusalem. The temple to Almighty God was also in Jerusalem. One gave authenticity to the other. Now the Jews had seven major feasts during the year. And during the time of David and following, the temple was the major focal point for these feasts, very briefly. The feast of the Passover and unleavened bread was in the spring, representing a new beginning, a new life. Passover uh, represented the redemption from bondage in history. That's the historical significance of it. The feast of unleavened bread also at the same time celebrated in the spring. They purged all the leaven from their homes uh, and ate you know, bread without leaven, uh, no leaven, no, ferment, uh, no fermented wine in the homes. 
And so this was a symbol of a purification. Um, that's the unleavened bread. These two uh, were together, celebrated together. Third feast was the feast of the first fruits, again in the spring, the first of the grain harvest. It was thanksgiving for the first fruits, the promise of the harvest to come. And of course, the first of the grain was offered to, was offered to God. The next feast was the Feast of Weeks. We know it better as the Feast of Pentecost that took place in the late springs, seven weeks plus a day after the Passover. It was the ingathering of the first harvest. Uh, it was thanksgiving for the first harvest and according, according to oral tradition, the time of the giving of the law at Sinai. Um, in the summertime, a time of labor in the fields and preparation for the final harvest in the church age. The spiritual dimension of these feasts in a Christian context. Then there was the Feast of Trumpets in the early autumn, a calling of assemble, a, a solemn assembly. The trumpets were blown in order to prepare for the the Day of Atonement, very important feast, which was the next one, Day of Atonement, again in autumn. This also was a solemn assembly for repentance and forgiveness under the law was repeated annually. The high priest went into the Holy of Holies where the ark was that one time during the year to offer sacrifice, representing the atonement for the sins of the people. And then there was the, the, seventh feast. the seventh feast was the Feast of Booths in the autumn. In autumn, the final harvest. It was a harvest celebration and it was also a memorial of tabernacles in the wilderness to remember that while they were in the wilderness wandering for 40 years, they lived in booths, they lived in tents. And so once a year they would again you know, go live in a tent if you wish. Uh, as a memorial of that particular time in their history. And even today, uh, modern Jews celebrate the Feast of Booths. Uh, sometimes you read about the problems that condominiums have because <laughs> they build these things on, on their porches you know, or on their galleries, on their balconies. And it's, count, it's contrary to the convention of the uh, of the condominium, you know, it's, it's a bylaw. You're not allowed to put anything on your balcony. You're not allowed to build anything there. And, and so uh, sometimes that becomes a, a, a dispute among people, just a modern day celebration of booths. So there you have seven major feasts. I just wanted to go over that uh, with you very quickly because during these feasts throughout the year, people would come to Jerusalem because before the establishment of synagogues, the people would only have the temple in Jerusalem as the main center for feasts and gathering and meeting with God. The idea of synagogues, you know, the house of prayers, that only began when the Jews were in, uh, when they had been carried off to uh, Babylon. And the temple was destroyed. They wanted to pray, they wanted to read the scriptures, they wanted to worship, so they worshiped in homes. Boy, doesn't that sound interesting? <laughs> and so the synagogue, house of prayer movement began while they were in Babylonian captivity. And then when they returned, they brought that back with them. And each town, each village had its own synagogue. But before that time, the temple was the main place of gathering. So as these feasts occurred, Thousands of Jews from all over Israel and the world would make the trip to Jerusalem. For some, it was an annual visit. We read about that, you know, uh, Joseph and Mary. Every year they would go to Jerusalem. You know, when Jesus uh, was lost, if you wish, there for several days, or they lost track of him for several days. For others, it was a once in a lifetime visit. It was a pilgrimage. You know, the Queen of Egypt, or the Ethiopian eunuch we read about in the book of Acts, was returning from a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Either way, the experience of the pilgrimage to the city was ex an exciting event for these people. And as a result, many Psalms were written about the experience of worship itself, 
or the experience of worshiping in the temple or traveling to the temple in order to worship and meet with God. Many Psalms were written about that experience. And so Psalms that dealt with this theme are called worship Psalms. They rejoice in the worship experience itself. So there's a little background to the worship Psalms. Uh, so let's take a look at a couple. Psalm 24, if you're following along, following along in your Bible, is a good one. I'll throw up the verses here. Psalm 24, interesting. Uh, it's a combination of a wisdom psalm and a worship psalm. Two psalms in one. Verses one to six is the wisdom psalm part. And remember wisdom psalms, they can be either experience psalms, character psalms, or ethical psalms. Those are wisdom psalms. Well, this one here, verses one to six, is a character psalm, a wisdom psalm uh, of the character variety which asks the question, who is worthy to go and worship God? So we begin verses one and two. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the river. So he establishes God's sovereignty and position as creator. Verse three asks the question, who may ascend? into the hill of the Lord, and who may stand in his holy place? So like wisdom psalms, right? There's a question, okay? Who, who can ascend the hill? Who can stand in the holy place? There we have some synonymous parallelism. The question is, who may go up into the city and meet with God and worship him in his holy city? Who is worthy of that? Verse four. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, he, uh, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. So the answer is one who is holy and sincere, holy in works, the hands. The hand, every, every time they talk about the hands, they're talking about the things you do, your deeds, your hands. Holy in thoughts, talks about the heart, what kind of heart you have. Sincere towards God, the soul does not move or swear uh, deceitfully, does not lift up the soul to falsehood. A person who is sincere towards man and God, he does not swear deceitfully. Verse five, he's not a liar. He's not a liar. You, you can take his word for what he says. Verse five. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. So the answer uh, before a person who's holy in works and thoughts, sincere towards God, sincere towards man, and this person who is like this will be considered righteous before God and this will be his blessing from the God that saves him. And so who can go up? Well, the righteousness is what enables a person to stand before or worship God. In that time, meaning who, who's worthy to go up to the temple and worship with the living God? Well, this man here who's righteous in his works and thoughts and so on and so forth. Verse six, he says, this is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob, Selah. So these are the kinds of people that want to come to worship God. Uh, they are Jacob's sons, the descendants of Jacob. By implication, they are the true sons of Abraham. By implication again, they're the sons of the promise. God made the promise to Abraham, that promise went on to Jacob, and now that promise goes forward to all those who are descendants of Jacob or Abraham. And, 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 and who are those people? Well, they're the ones who are honest towards God, sincere, and so on and so forth. All right, so that's the, that's the experience psalm, the wisdom psalm, verse one to six. So now he switches to a worship psalm. Um, another thing that you're going to find here, another device, antiphonal, meaning a response song. You know, in, in modern songs, you, know, you hear the chorus go, hey, and the other ones go, hey, you know, antiphonal answering back and forth, right? That's in modern music. Well, they had antiphonal songs 
in those days as well, and this particular psalm is an example. The worship part of this psalm is an example of that. And the, the two groups are uh, singers who are at the entrance of the city gate in the days when David brought the ark to rest in the city of Jerusalem after uh, having captured it from the Jebusites. There was a time where the Israelites in battle lost the ark. It's a long story, but they lost the ark and eventually the ark made its way back and David brought it back to the city with much singing and much pomp and so on and so forth. So this section here alludes back to that particular time. Verse seven, lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, the, uh, that the king of glory may come in. So the first group approach the city and its gates and they sing out to the sentries inside to open the gates and let the Lord, the ark, enter into the city. Verse eight A, who is the king of glory? Well, that's the response. The response from inside from the singers is the question, who is this king? Is it David? Verse 8b, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. So the answer is the Lord is the king of glory. He's the one who provides strength in battle and victory uh, to all the kings, including David. Verse 9, antiphonal. Whoop, the original group. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Repetition of the original request. Verse 10a, who is the king of glory? It goes back and forth. Who is the king of glory? That's the response. Verse 10b, the Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory, Selah. So a confirmation that the Lord of hosts, meaning the divine title of God, He is the King of glory who seeks to enter in to the city. Now this psalm not only praises God, but it is descriptive of the activity and the purpose of worship as well as being historical in nature. It was used for a special worship occasion for the time that David brought the ark back to the city. All right, let's look at another one, Psalm 84 this time. Now this Psalm 84 is considered a most excellent example of a worship psalm. Now there's a difference of opinion as to the occasion of its writing. Some scholars say that the author was prevented from going on a pilgrimage and he's recalling a previous pilgrimage that he did with much delight. Others say that the author is describing his joy and experience based on his visit to the temple. So some scholars say he's talking, about a time, he's talking about his visit. Others say he's talking about another time he visited. Either way, it'll come out to pretty much the same thing. It describes a particular delight for this worshiper at his experience in visiting and worship the temple. Verse one and two. How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts. My soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. So he's longing to arrive and be at the place where he can worship God. Not for the place itself, but for the experience of being in the presence of the Lord there. Verse three and four. The bird also has found a house and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. How blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Selah. So he contemplates on the joy of these great and small who find safety you know, in the Lord's house. He said the birds, you know, they make nests in the cornices and in the cracks of the wall and the and the columns, as birds do, right? They, they don't, you know, they'll, they'll make a nest in, in your eaves troughs or, or in your guttering, or they'll make a, a nest at the, at the, uh, uh, you know, at the uh, state house you know, in downtown Oklahoma. It don't matter to them, rich or poor, once they find a, a spot, they make a nest there. And he's saying, isn't it wonderful? The birds make nests in your you know, in your dwelling place, and sinners make atonement on the altars. Everybody finds a place there. The small and the great, they find safety 
in your dwelling place. How wonderful it is, verse five to seven. How blessed is the man whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Passing through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The early rain also covers it with blessings. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them appears before God in Zion. So he thinks about the difficulties of the trip and they are small in relationship to the joy of arriving and being in the presence of, of God. They even become stronger the closer they, you know, the closer they get to the temple, the stronger they, you know, the stronger they get, the more enthusiastic they become to arrive. Similarly with life, as we draw closer to God, we have strength to overcome difficulties and they seem insignificant when compared to the joy awaiting those who persevere and who arrive. And that's like anything, isn't it, in life? I mean, some people had long journeys to, to long and difficult and dangerous journeys to get to the temple, but as they arrived in Jerusalem, as they saw the city on the hill, as they saw the outline of the temple, their joy and their anticipation and so on and so forth, you know, grew. This is no, you know, no way an accurate comparison, but I remember as a boy uh, going to a Detroit Tiger Stadium the home of the Detroit Tigers, Major League Baseball. And for a little six-year-old boy, the first time that you go to a Major League Baseball park, if you're used to watching TV, and as, as, as a child, you know, we didn't have color TV in those days, so baseball was always in black and white. Everything was gray, you know, and the players you know, were, their uniforms were either very white or, or different shades of gray. And my dad took me to Tiger Stadium. I still remember it to this day. You, you know, like most stadiums, you go, you, know, you come in on the first floor, if you wish, on the ground floor where you get off the bus or you park the car and you walk and then, and then you go up the stairs and, and then as you come through the last stairs and come into the stadium and all of a sudden, there it is, you know, the green and the, the dark earth and the, the signs and it's just, it just, I remember as a child just took my breath away. It was like, oh, wow, you know, I mean, after having watched it on TV. So in the same way, these people having simply made prayers and uh, dreamt about visiting this and heard about it from other people or, or they saw the description of it you know, they read the books of Exodus as well, and they saw the descriptions in, uh, of the tabernacle anyways, but they, they, they heard about the temple, but nothing is like actually you know, coming over the horizon and seeing the city and the temple there on the hill. And so this is what he's, he's talking about. In verse eight and nine, he says, O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. Behold our shield, O God, and look upon the face of your, uh, of your anointed. So the pilgrim makes his prayer and petition. And this is where parallelism helps us to understand the meaning. In verse 9a, he asks God to look upon or bless or protect the shield. Behold our shield, O God. In verse 9b, he asks God to bless or look upon the face of the anointed of the people who is the king. So what is he saying exactly? Well, the, the pilgrim is praying for a blessing and protection of the king, since it is through his agency that the pilgrim can travel the land and come and enter into the worship. The king, he's the anointed one. He is a shield. He is a protector of the people. So here, all of this here, he's talking about the king himself. He says, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. So the pilgrim finishes with praise for the one who is the occupant of the temple, the reason why the pilgrimage is joyful and satisfying and possible. So he's prayed for the king, who's the shield guardian of the people, 
that permits him to actually physically travel and enter into the city, and then he praises God. He goes one further. The Lord, he says, he is a shield. The Lord is a sun, a light to his way. The Lord is the one who blesses the righteous, those who have a right to go to the holy mountain. Uh, the man who trusts in the Lord, he says, is truly a happy man. So the author climaxes with the reason for his joyful pilgrimage to the temple, and that, of course, is the Lord Himself. Very nice that he's impressed with the building. Very good that he offers a blessing for the king. That's proper. But in the end, you know, the real action, the real joy is I'm, I'm face to face with God. I've come to the place where God is. And this is the joy that he has. Imagine what they had and all the things that they had to do to get to Jerusalem and then they couldn't get any closer than the court outside. <laughs> they couldn't get any closer than that. Imagine, we, <laughs> today, we can come before the living God at any time, 24 hours a day. <laughs> while we're outside digging in the yard in the garden, while we're eating, while we're driving, we don't need to go to a certain place. You know, when, Paul, when Peter says, repent, let each of you be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within you. We become the temple. Imagine, they went to a physical temple, and in the New Testament, the New Covenant, we are the temple. We are walking around with the living God within us. I mean, if, if, if their experience provoked them to write these kinds of words, what should our experience provoke us to do? All right, one more, okay? We have time to do one more. Verse, uh, or excuse me, Psalm 122. So this is a pilgrim song describing the feeling of the pilgrim as he comes to Jerusalem and the temple. And most of these are like this. I mean, I'm just giving you different samples, okay? So verse one and two, he says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. So the writer describes both the feelings and the anticipation and joy when he prepared to go and arrived at the destination of his uh, pilgrimage. No information about the trip and how long it was and they had problems and nothing. He just said, I was happy when they said, let's go. And then boom, in the next sentence, they're there. All right, verses three to five. Jerusalem, that is built as a city that is compact together, to which the tribes go up, even the tribes of the Lord, an ordinance for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord, for their thrones were set for judgment the thrones of the house of David. So he marvels at the meaning, the layout, and the history of a city. Wow, what is it? It's as if he's got his tourist guide book and he's going, wow, this city is just amazing. The beauty of the temple and the significance of the activity going on there, the sacrifices being made. The history and the rulership that has come from this city beginning with David and according to God's promise, will go on forever for the Jewish people as they remain faithful. So for the pilgrim, this is the eternal city of God and he is struck in awe of it when he finally arrives on his pilgrimage. So interesting, he, he doesn't talk about the king, he talks about the history and the significance of the city, how many people have come here before me, and the priests have been there, and this is where Solomon was, and you know, he's just amazed by the whole experience. Verse six to nine, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. He says, for the sake of my brothers and my friends, I will now say, may peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. So you know, he came to pray to God. He came to rejoice before God. But now he's moved to offer a blessing upon the city itself. What does he say? Peace for the city a blessing for those who love it and who prosper it. Remember, I mean, you know, Jerusalem had been attacked many times. 
he deepens his own commitment to serve it and by extension, right, to serve the Lord himself. So basically, here's a man who comes to the temple with a glad heart and he's so moved by the sheer presence of God that he sees there, he rededicates himself. Today, what would we say? He comes forward. I got to do something. It's, it's so wonderful, the history of it, my religion and the meaning of it. I, I just have to do something. So he rededicates himself. You know, the experience of rededication and recommitment is one that we should experience when we come into the presence of God. I mean, there's nothing unusual about that. There's nothing even embarrassing about that. It's something as old as, well, as this, uh, this particular psalm uh, demonstrates. All right, so those are three uh, worship psalms that I wanted to share with you. I didn't know how long it would take, so we're, we're going to finish a little early here.